Loving God, we just want you. Nothing else, nothing in of ourselves, God. We just want you. And we pray now that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would experience a, a moment, one of those God moments, when you come and you speak to our hearts, and we don't want to leave your presence, but we just want to sit here and spend time with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, praying that it won't be my words, but your words shared today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our sermon title today is Family Rules, again, the last one in the series, I believe. And uh, this is a summer series that I've done. And our last one today is Belonging. And it is from John chapter 17 that we're going to be in today. We're going to be in John chapter 17. Have you ever had something that they call a dark night of the soul? It's like that time when Jacob wrestled with God. The time when Abraham felt... Uh, like God wanted him to sacrifice his only beloved son, his son that he loved so much, and he wondered what in the world is going on. Uh, it's, it's that moment that you wonder, what is God thinking right now? He really wants me to do this. He's really calling me to this. I'm really going through this right now. That dark night of the soul, that it's, it's that valley of the shadow that Psalm 23 talks about. And, uh, you know, it was interesting this last week, recently, the, the last couple of weeks, actually, um, Gideon and I, when Gideon's getting ready to go to sleep, it started um, the night before his first day of preschool. He was so nervous. He was up late at night, and I kept looking in. As the time went on and on, I kept looking in, and he's still awake. His eyes were open, and he wasn't sleeping. And I finally went and I said, Gideon, what's the matter? Why can't you sleep? Are you nervous? He said, yes, Mommy, I'm nervous. It's my first day of school, of preschool. And so I said, OK. So I, I went and lay next to him, and I was talking to him. And something that we did, which was really meaningful, was we, we recited Psalm 23 together. And I am so amazed at his questions. <laughs> He'd be like, Mommy, what is that? What is the valley of the shadow? We were talking about it last night again as we were reciting Psalm 23 together. He said, Mommy, what is the valley of the shadow? And I said, well, the valley of the shadow, it's kind of like when you go to preschool and Mommy drops you off and Mommy has to go and you don't want Mommy to leave you and you're afraid to be by yourself. That's, that's like the valley of the shadow. And um, anyway, it, it was really a beautiful moment when he realized, and I said, but Jesus is with us, with us even in the valley. And so Jesus was in one of those moments. This was probably the, the valley of the shadow, the, literally the valley of the shadow of death, right before him in this moment. He, he prays one of the longest prayers ever recorded, the longest prayer ever recorded by Jesus. And this is such a powerful prayer in John 17. And I like how even though other, the Synoptic Gospels, they all say, let this cup pass from me when Jesus is praying. But in this John chapter 17, it has a different kind of a feel to it than in the other Gospels. When you read John 17 about this prayer that Jesus is praying in his darkest valley, in his dark moment, the dark night of the soul moment for Jesus, he, there's no gloom, there's no sadness, there's no heaviness. It's more a beautiful prayer of faith to accomplish together for him. Uh, so let's, let's look at this. We won't be able to read it all. But I love how he not only prays for his, himself, but he prays for his disciples and he even prays for you and for me in John chapter 17. And how more appropriate 
as we think about belonging and being a family together and belonging to God and belonging to each other. So let's read that passage. John chapter 17, and we're reading verses 1 through 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Here in Jesus' darkest hour, he didn't just think about himself, he thought about others. And the first thing he thought about was God's glory, which is amazing. Um, in his darkest hour, he didn't stress, he didn't uh, get frustrated or, or down or whatever. He, he reached out to God in prayer. He trusted on the one that he belonged to. He belonged to God. And so in his darkest time, he reached out to him. He prayed to God. And I think that this is an invitation to us to pray. When we're going through a hard time, we need to be praying to God, to spend time in communion with him. When you can't see a way through your dark valley, when you're tossed by the winds of chaos around you, you don't even know which way is up and down. And when you can't see what God is doing, pray. And prayer is the answer to every problem in life, and it's that key that unlocks that heavenly storehouse of blessing. And it's praying to our friend. Um, and there's nothing more beautiful than to just pour out our hearts to God, especially in difficult times. When God asks you to do def something difficult, when someone has a difficult conversation with you, when you are dealing with some, a problem that you can't even face on your own, when you're sitting, standing there wondering, why? Why, God, are you allowing this to happen in my life after I've loved you, I've served you my entire life? Why? Jesus' response was to call out to God in prayer. When you can't tell what God is doing, pray. And honestly, I wonder sometimes if the bumps that we go through in life are God's invitation for us to pray. Because he knows that if we were just, everything was good and happy and great, we wouldn't even think about praying to God because we wouldn't need him. But he allows us sometimes to go through difficult challenges because he knows that through those challenges, our connection with God is going to deepen. I think the, the, the challenge for us, because I've, in my life, I've had a couple of major challenges, and in those major challenges, one time I remember I, I turned to God and I prayed, I cried out to him, I trusted him. Another time, I got angry and bitter and frustrated. It took a while for me to, to move beyond that. So I think the challenge to us is that when you're faced with a difficulty, when you're faced with a struggle, when you're faced with a hard time, to respond by calling out to God the way Jesus did. To respond with faith and trust in him and what he is doing, his will and his plan for our lives. And that is something that will give us hope and strength and that, that positive outlook, that, that joy they talk about in the midst of trials. It starts out by saying that Jesus lifted his eyes up to heaven. And this is one of the wonderful ways that the scripture talks about people praying. And we don't just have to bow our heads and close our eyes. I mean, that's good when we're teaching our kids. It helps them focus, which is good. But in the Bible, they also fell prostrate before God, lying down completely. If you haven't done that, try it. It's a different way of praying, and it's kind of cool. Um, and also, they would look up to heaven 
and talk to God, which if you're outside looking up at the sky, it kind of makes it feel more real to talk to God out there in the universe looking up. But to me, it's, it's a beautiful picture of faith and trust in God that he looks up. He looked up into heaven because he looked up realizing that there was a God in heaven above his trial, above his difficulty, seeing a view above ours. I love this song. I've, I was listening to the song uh, this last week. And uh, it was a song that I remember hearing in high school. <laughs> and it came on the radio at just the right time. And um, it's the voice of truth. The voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth, uh, it, it, look it up. It's a really good song, especially when you're going through difficulty or God is asking you to do something hard and you're sitting there going, but I don't want to do it. I'm nervous. Ah, I can't do it. Uh, the voice of truth tells me a different story. And, and so he talks about the, the song talks about the waves and the giant and how it's just so overwhelming, but how we can soar with the wings of eagles looking over. And when we're in the wings of eagles, when we're in God's vision, when he's showing us his perspective, his perspective is so much higher than the winds and the waves and the giant. And, and we can accomplish this with his strength. And I see Jesus in that moment looking up to God in heaven, knowing that God is above his trial and his difficulty, knowing that trusting in God, he is right there with him, soaring on the wings of eagles, overlooking whatever challenge, overlooking the cross, that he was even past the cross in that moment, knowing that God was going to bring him through. That was what he was saying, what it's saying when he was lifting his eyes up to heaven, to God. Because God is the one who can defeat the giants, and God is the one who can calm the storms. And when we trust in God, he will give us victory over the challenges that we face in our lives. And no matter how weak we may feel, God is strong, and he can help us face whatever that he is bringing up to us in our journey. So Jesus called on God, his Father. He calls us to have a relationship with God because we belong to God. Jesus said, call God his Father. And Jesus knew that he was God's son. He knew that he belonged to God. And one of the reasons he knew is because God told him when he was baptized, it was as clear as clear could be, you are my beloved son in whom I, who I love in whom I'm well pleased. And I believe that God says that same thing to you and to me when we trust in him and we believe in him, that he calls you and me his beloved son, his beloved daughter in whom he is well pleased. Even when we fall short, even when we mess up, we make mistakes, he calls us his children when we put our trust in him. So Jesus called on God his Father, and he calls us also to call on God our Father because he belonged to God, and we also belong to God. We have our belonging in him. <clears throat> and sometimes it can be hard to understand our belonging in God. How can God be my heavenly Father? How can I belong to him when... I can't feel him right now, or I can't see him in my life right now, or, or this challenge or difficulty seems so hard to face. How can I really trust that? How can I know my belonging and acceptance with him that I'm his beloved child? And it just brings me back to Gideon with his very dark valley. I'm talking about my Gideon, not the Gideon in the Bible. <laughs> that one too. In fact, when I was choosing a name, I thought about that Gideon, and I thought, I'm sure my son is going to face some pretty big challenges. I'm sure he's going to get nervous, like I do. And I want him to know that God is more powerful, that he is a great and mighty warrior with God's help. And I'm seeing it before my eyes. Here's my son, and he's getting nervous. And I can tell him, even in the dark valleys, God is with you. But it's hard because... I, the other day, I, I tried to drop him off, and he was clinging to me. Mommy, don't leave me. And it breaks your heart as a parent when you, 
you, I literally had to like pry him off of me and hand him to the teacher and run away. <laughs> and that's, that's so hard. And I know that there are times that God's heart breaks. God's heart breaks when we can't feel or experience him in the way that we'd like to in a certain moment. And to us, it seems completely unfair. I heard a preacher say um, something really, really funny, <laughs> which is, if you were to give a three-year-old everything that they wanted, how long do you think that they would stay alive? <laughs> I mean, really, if you gave them just Say you had a day where they could have everything, where my son could have everything he wanted. He'd be covered in sugar. He would have a stomach ache. He wouldn't sleep well because he didn't want to go to sleep. A lot of times we feel in the moment like God should do this one thing or he should deal with this in this one way, but we don't see God's perspective. And we're like the little three-year-old who wants sugar and wants, you know, wants, wants to never sleep and all of that. And God is like, just trust me. Just trust me because I'm with you. I'm your God and I love you. Just like in that moment that I have to pry him off and leave him in preschool, run away and come back, I know that eventually it's going to be for his good, that he's going to grow through it, that it's going to be good for all of us, and that it's going to get better. <laughs> But it's hard to believe that sometimes. And I love how in Jesus' prayer, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. In Jesus' prayer, it wasn't just for himself. He was to be glorified for the benefit of the universe and for the benefit of God, his glory. And I think a lot of times when we pray, sometimes we get caught up in what we want. We get caught up in our own desires, our own needs, our own struggles, that we forget that prayer isn't just about God answering and saying exactly what we want, but prayer is ultimately for God's glory. It's not to bring glory or benefit to us, but it's to bring glory to God. So if we're praying for our finances, let those finances benefit the kingdom of God. If I'm praying for good health, may my health cause me to bless others and, and work for God in a way that I haven't been able to before. If I'm praying for a relationship to be healed, may I pray for that relationship to be healed for the benefit of God's kingdom and for God's glory. So Jesus shows us that we pray not just for ourselves, we pray for God's glory to be accomplished in and through us, to those around us. And I love how in the Gospel of John, Jesus' glorification is really being lifted up on the cross. And it's kind of strange. It, it, it doesn't seem to make much sense, does it, that Jesus is praying to be lifted up, and his being lifted up is actually the cross. That is his glorification. But it tells me that no matter what situation that you or I might be going through in life, that God uses those very situations to strengthen us and to lift us up and to glorify himself in and through us. You may be facing a really difficult time, but may God's glory work through and be accomplished through you in that time, his glorification was through the cross. His greatest moment of suffering brought the most glory to God and lifted him up. And here in this prayer, we, we hear this relationship between Jesus and God. It's really beautiful. It's unlike any prayer that we pray because they're in complete harmony and they're Jesus is exalting God, and he's praying about God exalting him. And this, this type of relationship, and it's clear that they belong to each other, that Jesus belongs to God, and God belongs to Jesus.
And it says, as you've given him authority, verse 2 and 3, as you've given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus is lifted up. He's given authority over all flesh. And we have eternal life through Jesus. Jesus gets all the glory and the honor. And it's like Philippians, that we looked at Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus humbling himself so completely, and then God exalting him above the whole universe. And when we belong to God, we know that we can go to him no matter what we're facing, that we can go to him because we belong to him, that he loves us so much, and that his desire is for us to be well and for his purposes to be accomplished through us because he knows that that is what will bring us the most joy in life is for his purpose to accomplish, be accomplished in and through us. So we belong to God. Another thing that I see in this text is that we belong to each other. In John 17, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. And I pray for them. He's, he's talking now about his disciples, praying for his disciples. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And... Um, I just want to pause for a second and just say that it is really powerful the way that Jesus prays for his disciples. And I believe that God calls you and I to pray for those that we mentor, those that we, um, that we care for spiritually, and, and for our family, most importantly for our kids. That there's this beautiful thing about in verse 6, it says that you gave them to me and they have kept your word. And he's praying for, for God to keep them just as he has been faithful with them. And I love how it says, you gave them to me. We are gifts from God. We are gifts from God to Jesus. And also, God gives us gifts of children in our lives and, or loved ones in our lives that he calls us to pray for. He calls us to care for spiritually. And we need to pray for those people. <laughs> And so let's, finish, let's read uh, 15 to 19. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Now, it's interesting. You say, how could Jesus sanctify himself? Um, the word sanctified also could be dedicate, being dedicated for a specific purpose. And so it's, it's my thought that since he uses it about himself, he's actually talking about dedicating his disciples. May you dedicate them. Because in John 15, it says, you are already clean. Jesus told them, you are already clean. You're already washed. You're already clean. So he's not talking about sanctifying, like cleansing them, but he's talking about dedicating them to this specific task the task of being missionaries to the entire world and spreading the gospel around the world. So dedicate them. And ded I dedicate myself, he says, for this cross that he's facing. And here is when it really gets awesome. Jesus prays for us. He prayed for you and he prayed for me. Verses 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, 
And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for you and for me. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) And he's even praying for us now, the Bible says. He's continuing to pray for us. And and he wants us to do well. And he wants us to be connected with him. He wants us to succeed in this earthly existence. And he, he prays for us. He thinks about us. He loves us. The part, I think, that has us really asking God, why did you put this part in here? Which is that they may be one. <laughs> and we look down through the embarrassing history of, of all the different breakoffs of the church and why are there so many churches and why are there so many, even in, in, you know, in one denomination or in one church and there's split offs from different churches and, and church plants that aren't church plants, but they're really splits and, you know, different things go on. And, and we look around and we say, well, why did you say let us be one? And then we're just so fractured. It seems like we're just so divided. How can we be one? How can we be one with God and one with each other? Well, God calls us to belong. He calls us to belong to him and to belong to each other. And it's only when we belong to Jesus, when we have a relationship with him, when we walk with him, when we listen to him and his word, that we can really truly be one with each other as believers in Jesus and as church family and in our families. I mean, imagine that perfect unity. What would it look like to have perfect unity? He talks about this perfect unity in verse 23. What would it look like to have perfect unity in our homes? What would it look like to have perfect unity in our marriages? What would it look like to have perfect unity in our families or, or at church in our, our Sabbath schools and in our, our board meetings and, and our, our worldwide church as the Adventist church? What would it look like to have perfect unity? I mean, that sounds like such an unattainable thing to have perfect What is perfect unity? And... Really, when you think about biblical perfect unity, it is full surrender to God and submission to each other. That is that perfect unity. Jesus perfectly submitted to God and the Holy Spirit submitted to to God, the Father, and to Jesus. And the Father even submits to Jesus by lifting him up and exalting him above all. And God calls us to have that same type of unity, that mutual submission, that caring for each other enough to, to listen and to work together and to, uh, to be that family that God calls us to, that Holy Spirit unity. It takes putting ourselves aside, like we talked about in Philippians 2 a while back, put ourselves aside, our own preferences, our own opinions, our own desires to listen to the other person. And I think it's so hard to do that, especially when someone's views are just completely different from yours on a topic. It's so hard to just sit down and to listen. But, you know, in this world today, there's so much polarization. There's so much disagreement. I mean, just look at the political world right now, one extreme to the other extreme. I don't think there have been so many extremes ever. (laughs) I mean, since I've been around in this country, um, it just seems so polarized. And you look around, you wonder, how, how can we ever be unified? How can there ever be real, true unity? But the truth is that God calls us to be family. And being family sometimes is hard because as a family of God, I mean, just think about your family. I think everyone has a relative. You might be a family of Democrats and you have a really strong Republican in your family, or you might be a family of Republicans, a really strong Democrat. It's someone that doesn't really fit, but what do you do? You love them because they're your family, right? And so God calls us to be family together and to love each other. 
And I just have to say, I apologize to my parents in advance um, if they're listening, but I'm going to call them out. <laughs> I love my parents because this is the perfect example. My, my father is as strongly Republican as you can get, uh, listens to talk radio. I grew up you know, hearing Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, all of that. And so he's, he's really strong. He, he owns his guns, and he, he, you know, he's all for the NRA, everything. My mom, <laughs> this is just as beautiful as beautiful, beautiful can be, the extreme of this. My mom is a beautiful, loving, you know, she's a Democrat, and she's, she listens to NPR faithfully. Like, it's, it's religion. It'll be on in the car. It'll be on at, at, at home. In one side of the house might be NPR, and the other side might be talk radio. But <laughs> and it can be really tense during election season. I remember growing up, it was, you just kind of walking around like, you know, this argument throwing out this way, this way. Oh, this person is going to be a great president. No, oh, my goodness, how can you say that? But I have to say this because they are family, and they love each other. And even though they might disagree on politics drastically, they love each other and they respect each other because they know that they're family. And because they love each other, even though they might not agree with everything that they may believe, they still love each other. And they're to, they've been together for many years now. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, and, you know, most of us might not have those extreme differences in our families, but we love each other because God loves us and he calls us to love each other. And I love how God gives the basis for being his family and for being unified. Obviously, we don't just unite on anything. Um, there are guidelines, there are two main things that are our foundation in which this unity can occur, this spiritual and Christian unity. And those are, number one, Jesus. He is our foundation. Believing in Jesus. And he talks about his disciples believing in him. He talks about us believing. It says, I pray for those who will believe in me through, the, through their word, through the testimony of the disciples. So belief in Jesus is foundational. It must be foundational. And then the second thing is his word, the word that he passed on through his disciples, the testimony of Jesus in scripture. That is foundational. Of course, scriptural teachings, that is foundational. If, if we're trying to argue something that's that, um, against something that's, that's scriptural, uh, then that's not, we're not listening to the body of Christ and having that unity, which is basically this unity is, is putting myself aside and surrendering, submitting to God through his word, submitting to his word. It, and um, there, I think that there are a lot of peripheral issues and a lot of, a lot of debates right now in, in the church and a lot of these debates, you know, some of them are sideline issues that honestly don't, don't really matter, and some of them do really matter. Um, but God calls us to, first of all, submit to his word, which means that his word must have authority over our lives, that God has authority first and foremost over our lives, that being Christian means surrendering to God's word. What does he say in his word? And this is where it gets difficult because one group might say, well, he says this in his word. and Another group says, no, he says that in his word. And that's when we have to stop and study each for ourselves. What does God really say through his word? Is this person right? Is that person right? Are they both wrong? And, you know, there are a lot of different issues today and there are a lot of social movements in society. And um, God doesn't call us to just jump onto whatever society is doing. Neither does he call us to just reject everything. Uh, I mean, when slavery, the issue of slavery came around and the abolitionist movement came around, uh, there were a lot of people who opposed it. 
believing that slavery was right according to scripture. And they had scriptural verses and they backed it up in scripture, verse after verse. I mean, about slavery, slavery that God instituted slavery, they believed it. And then in the abolitionist movement, there were others who said, no, actually in the Bible, there are a lot of principles of loving each other, of praying for your enemies, of, of being, uh, of, um, uh, being free in Christ, freedom in Christ. Well, how, do you, how do you get away from that? And so God calls us to listen, not to just block everything out, but to listen. Listen to what society says, and then read your word. Read, read God's word. Read the Bible. Read your Bible. And as we listen to others and we read scripture, God is going to make clear what truth is even in today, in today's age. And that means that we also need to be able to listen to what other people, if other people have interpretations, we need to also be hum, hum, humbly recognize that our views on certain things may be wrong, we might need to change as well. And that is something that it takes the Holy Spirit through his word to reveal those things. And that, that's hard to do. And it's hard sometimes for people to admit that because um, the past and tradition gives us a sense of, of security. And so it's, it's really scary to navigate that sometimes and realizing that, that um, God through his word might be leading us to dig deeper than we had past thought. Um, But God calls us to be unified through his word. He calls us to be grounded in who he is and to wrestle with things together as the body of Christ, knowing that you and I are brother and sister and that you and I, we love each other and we embrace each other. Even when we disagree on certain things, on things that are not core foundational issues, that we love each other first and foremost and that we are the body of Christ, the family of Christ. And this is the oneness that God calls us to. And I think as Adventists, we are passionate about scripture and about truth because that is, that is very important and that is, that is the foundation of our church and that is so important. And we, we recognize the, that Sabbath is important. And, and even the formation of our church, we don't see as disunity it's not disunity. We see it as being faithful to our conscience and the truth in God's word, the truth of the Sabbath and the truths that he's given us have led us to this powerful movement that we're in. And, and so I think that we, you know, it's, it's sometimes we want to throw out that scripture. One, you know, one, we don't want to, because it's been so misused by other people to be one, because there's this worldwide, this call to unity, unity that's not based on Christ or, or foundation on scripture, but just unity. And you can't just be united on anything. You've got to be grounded in what's important in scripture and in, in God and through his spirit. So we're going to close with, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. And I love this song. And I love how in Jesus' prayer, it's all about Jesus being exalted. And it's all about knowing him. And if you, if you don't know Christ, if you haven't had a relationship with him, if you've never been baptized, and you're here and you're saying, I want to learn how to grow deeper. I want to be that family. I want to be a part of the family, the family that loves each other, the family who cares for each other, the family that's rooted and grounded in love and in God, in Jesus. I want to be part of that. If that's your desire, then please come forward and join us here at the front for prayer. And as we sing, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. And then I also want to, really appeal to all of us to pray, to pray for unity in our own lives, with our own families, 
in our church and around the world. May we pray for unity in Christ that is scriptural because that is so needed today in this crazy time and political climate. So may we sing and they'll know we are Christians by our love because this is our witness that we may be one and God may be revealed in our love for each other. Mm -hmm.